Walter, it's great to see you, but it's especially good to see you with this new book, Ages of Water. It's been a long time in coming, but I think it's been worth waiting for. How do you feel? I suppose it's about six years' work, but the background to it, to any work, of course, is what one's been doing for the last 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, so the actual writing is the last half dozen years. Yes. What I found reading it, because you, I thought rather cleverly, didn't tell me a whole lot about it. Here's the manuscript. But I, it dawned on me after a little while that this is Walter's life. Was I right? It's, um, it's an attempt at a kind of autobiography. Uh, you can't write in the way now that Wordsworth wrote when he wrote his big poetic autobiography, which was the, the 1805 prelude. That just wouldn't work nowadays. Uh, so for me, the way to do it is to put together, uh, like a mosaic, a large number of um, different elements, fragments, uh, rather than try and make a single narrative out of it. It's multiple narratives, which I ho and I've given a clue, I hope, to that in one of the epigraphs to the book, which says, um, racontons jamais autre, autre chose uh, que sa propre vie. Does one ever tell anything but one's own story? Why did you call it the ages of water? Um, well, we're 90 odd percent water. Uh, it's the one element which is constant in us. Uh, nothing happens on earth uh, in the way of growth <laughs> without water. Well, almost nothing. Um, and the ages is it's another reference back to the notion of a, uh, a sto one story. Uh, yes. A history of um, not just who one is, uh, but the context one has lived in and worked in. Yes. Because I still probably unfashionably uh, believe that the poet has a social role. It's not, uh, it's not about just telling one's story. It's not about self-expression. Poems are not for the poet, they're for the reader. And therefore, whatever world uh, the poet inhabits. I think you succeed because it never comes across as self-indulgent and it never comes across as you want to cover up this bit, the clean bits, the tidy bits only. <laughs> it begins with birth, smeared with blood, etc. And that's, you know, it's, an, it's a part that everybody has experienced, but nobody talks about it. Sure. They look at the lovely little sweet angelic face and only that is remembered. But yours is in front of us, and, and I think it's something we have to all look at. So it's not about you, it's about life. And the other end of the process. Exactly, yes, yes. Um, it's got many, many facets. Uh, like anything which I think it's, so, it has that range of material, um, it's not something I would ever read it once, it would take me a long time, and did take me a long time. The same way as I would never eat a whole box of my very favourite dark <laughs> and wonderful chocolate, <laughs> because that would spoil the whole thing. I should never want it again. I should want these poems again, but each to be savoured for its own meaning. Well, part, of the, part of what I look for in making a poem is a kind of of concentration in the writing which produces in the reader a certain intensity of attention. Yes. I want the poems to offer something memorable. Why would one bother writing anything that wasn't memorable? Poetry is not the most fashionable genre. Uh, people come to it very often in times of difficulty, in times of stress. Uh, they need to be getting something back from it other than my self-indulgence. And the test of that, the test of authenticity in that sense in the poem, is partly its technical craft, its skill, and that concentration. And it's that intensity of attention which is what we remember. 
that just that one piece alone is so deep and so um, worked at over many many years maybe over a lifetime because very few people would arrive at that with little with no thought nobody could when do you think your earliest um, inclination to write poetry I can remember it very clearly can you? actually uh, it was a two particular incidents the first was in my first year at Hamilton Academy we had a school teacher called Mr Gatherall uh, of whom I have not thought in many years uh, who invited us uh, to read some Wordsworth sonnets and then to write a sonnet and we had 40 minutes I think to write a sonnet uh, it was the first sonnet I had written and I was quite pleased with myself yes <laughs> foolishly perhaps um, and that was the beginning of uh, an awareness that that was what I wanted to do. Uh, but I'd always probably been obsessional about language anyway. So the linguistic interest was there. Uh, and then it was crystallised by this um, invitation or command rather to write a sonnet. Not a very common request these days, I Possibly wouldn't think. Possibly not, no. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> to define a sonnet, well, let's not go there. So you must have been very language aware as a young child. Yes, of course. Where does that come from? Well, it came from having to go to speech therapy for many years. In um, Glasgow, uh, dent in origin, partly Glasgow Dental Hospital and partly York Hill. So I can remember as a very small child being taken into uh, both these places uh, to have speech therapy. And I'm sure that has always been, uh, that linguistic difficulty in my earliest childhood has always been part of my um, motivation uh, to be uh, obsessional about languages. And, um, but language is dear to us. Of course. And not just the standard English, but the the voice you write in english you write in scots and the scots too is natural um i read it as somebody who had scots grandparents and a scots father my mother's side was gaelic so i hear the natural speech i never detect anything that he's oh he stopped there to go and get the dictionary and look up a word that i've never heard of anyhow so i'm going to be stuck there's never that. So you must have had quite a, a rich resource of Scots as a child. Well, the people I grew up with, uh, I was uh, farmed out, as it were, to my mother's parents. And these were people who were born at the tail end of the 19th century in an entirely rural setting. So my grandfather, I doubt if he ever read a book in his life, uh, he was completely familiar with the uh, the repertoire, the Burns repertoire, particularly of songs. My grandmother has a great repertoire of Irish songs, as well as Scots songs. Um, they were both Scots speakers. Uh, Scots wouldn't have been tolerated at school. Uh, it was Hamilton Academy, it was very formal. Um, so Scots was certainly among the first languages I heard. But of course I heard both. I was lucky in primary school, we had a rather progressive headmaster called James Wilson, uh, who was quite keen on having us uh, learn about Scottish history, uh, read Scottish poems. So my first ever McDermott poem uh, was in primary school. It really? was The Bubbly Joke. Oh my uh, word. Now that in those days I think would have been quite unusual. Oh yes, I think so. The other thing I would add to that is that, uh, I think I've said to you before, uh, people will ask me about writing in English or writing in Scots as though they were alternatives. They're not really alternatives for me because I don't write an Englishman's English. I very much write a Scotsman's English. And the brief time I lived in England, in Cambridge, I was never taken for an Englishman, of course. Um, but the... The background which lies behind the language, which is implied by what one writes and what one says, is entirely Scots-Irish, and even with a bit of the Gaeltacht in the background, that whole context is absent for an Englishman. 
Yes. And therefore the language is different, their expressions are different, and particularly their speech rhythms are different. Yes. It's yes. the sound of the language which is different. Yes. You get a hint of something else. Your fascination with French, the personnages, the snowdrops. And it's as you drop the word in quite naturally, the French word for snowdrop, but you had a long fascination with the language and the culture. Well, on that subject then, it's maybe not surprising that you wrote a poem about Marie Stuart. Would you like to read that one? J'étais reine couronnée de France. Je suis par Dieu la reine d'Écosse. Ended the feast, the courtly dance, the queen of loss. No loss nor bitterness shall blot my soul. Their prudent treason, triumph of all I am not, my son, my barren cousin on her throne. Betrayed by sex and by my heart, I loved the beautiful, the false, the weak. No mortal man is set apart, how soon they break. Weak, so I loved and weaker lost. Cut out my heart, cut off my head. Cheated of life, I pay the cost. They will not cheat me of my God. On the night before her execution, she was refused access to a, a priest to say her confession. Uh, she was allowed to see the French ambassador, but that was a piece of unnecessary cruelty. Mm. It's been a long time in coming you have certainly not spent the time just waiting for this to happen. You have done so much in those years. And if I might say so, you've done such a lot for other poets and writers. You've published quite a number of very prestigious poets over these years. From When did you begin publishing? With the Chapman, I suppose, um, which would be... The ideas were put together in 1969, and there's a, a particular social and political background to that. Uh, Hamilton had become the first con Scottish constituency to elect an SNP MP since the only other occasion in 1945 when Dr Robert McIntyre was elected for Motherwell. Uh, but he lost his seat after a few months at the, on the occasion of the 1945 general election. And then there had been a lead-up to events in Hamilton with uh, a by-election, I think it was in Govan, another in Hillhead. But Hamilton had suddenly uh, crystallised what was an increasingly um, believable uh, movement uh, in in Scottish, in Scottish politics. Uh, and bearing in mind, of course, I was interested in this anyway because Hugh McDermott, Christopher Grieve, was one of the founders of the National Party, which later became the Scottish National Party. After, I was part of a very, very small part of Mrs Ewing's campaign, working in the back office, uh, putting together statistical reports from canvassing and so on. And at the same time, uh, there had been local elections in Hamilton where uh, Hamilton became the first SNP councillor. Hamilton had the first SNP council in Scotland. Uh, and one of the SNP councillors was George Hardy, who I had got to know through the Scottish National Party, but who was interested in literature and poetry and so on. And that was how we came to put together uh, the very first issues of the Chapman. Uh, George, as you've said, it was the West Coast, not the West Coast, but the West. Mm. Uh, his primary interest was as much folk song as it was in what I think of as, what he would have thought of as classical poetry. Um, and that was also, of course, how I first got to actually meet Chris Grieve, although we had corresponded before because he contributed occasionally to the local newspaper, which was the Hamilton Advertiser. You were a very political young man. You were yes, I was very, yes. yes. Well, I was coming from a mining background, yes. having gone to a very, in its day, a very pucker school. So that, that conflict between these two worlds was always present. Yes. Cause and I suppose it was an effort to reconcile those two worlds. And of course, since most of our early memories stay with us, 
because they're so strongly imprinted on us in our formation, yes. they are almost always in a family context. So that's what part of what one, what shapes one. On that subject, um, early in the spring, in fact, just when the first snowdrops appeared, you sent me a poem that you thought I might like called Our Grandmother. Well, and of course, it, it begins with a snowdrop and certainly spoke very spoke to me and would you like to read it? A grandmother. A snowdrops in the garden yesterday, des personnages. I dreamed of you, forty years dead, of reconciliation for a break that never was. Only these little spears of loneliness, only irreparable loss. If one and that's it says so much uh, to me at least they were a, they were a very uh, generous kind loving couple yes I I get um, for some it might just be about a snowdrop or but maybe more a bit more but it's so profound and full of emotion they were love. the they were the people who always encouraged me to do whatever it was I was going to do and assured me that it would always be a great success. I never had opposition uh, or obstacles put in my way by them. I forgot to count all the poems. There are a lot of them. <laughs> Did you count them? No, I have no idea. Well, it must be about a hundred, I would think. I think there are over a hundred, but you don't count them. And each one unfolds into this quite remarkable anthology of poetry. The Ages of Water. I think it's a book that will endure. Um, I think you've been very patient and giving to other people in waiting for it to happen. Did, or did you feel that there had to be a right time to publish this book? I didn't really want it to be finished. Uh, I'm, there's a sense in which it's not finished. And this is where um, I think back to the way in Whitman, uh, the American poet, produced his one book of poems, The Leaves of Grass. He kept adding to it. Uh, what I discovered as a writer, uh, as a poet, was that I can't work in a vacuum uh, I need a framework, uh, and it's the framework which also helps produce uh, the next set of poems. Uh, so the general conception of the Ages of Water was to be a kind of big Gladstone bag into which I could uh, drop all the different elements, or many of the different elements of my experience, and keep on doing so without, and because it's a large framework, uh, without ever having to reinvent myself and uh, getting to the stage where I don't especially want to reinvent myself. What I want to do is um, uh, um, use what I have available for whatever time is left, which I'm expecting to be about 30 years or so. Well, I'm hoping anyway. Well, as you say, you, you, did, you never wanted it to be finished. Quite. And isn't that a bit like life? Um, like the old fellow said when he was asked, and have you lived here all your life? Not yet, he said, <laughs> not yet. And I think it's a bit like that. Um, but the reader doesn't want it to be finished either. Mm. And is glad it's not. Um, maybe we'll pause there and we can go over to some questions as... Um, those, some have read it and some have not, but I'm sure there's quite a lot of questions among us here, so we'll pause there and take a few of these. Thanks, Walter. Thank you.